All right, welcome to this next episode of Clinically Press. Today we are going to do a roundtable discussion where we're going to discuss some of the controversy, some of the do's and don'ts that is supplementation, and really just introduce the chaos, I guess, that is supplementation. Uh, some of the things that can be important to look for, um, how it can help, who can benefit from it, and so forth. So, shed a little light. Yeah, maybe exactly. <laughs> Our small ability yeah, to do as that. As you can see by the display here, there's a lot of the different options, a lot of misconceptions, so hopefully we'll clear some of those up today. And this is just a small smidgen of what's out there. Yep. we got a pretty good variety, though. We do. Yeah, it's it's actually pretty impressive. So, I know one of the big things like we want to talk about and cover is just, and we were just talking about it, but what is like a supplement in terms of the bigger picture? And I know... Um, as we've offered like your weight loss 101 classes, I don't think you've mentioned supplements once in any of them. Right. And I think that's something that we all really like to hit on is the supplement is just that, a supplement. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's on, that nothing will go on and replace your whole food diet. Yeah, most of the research, you know, kind of supports the idea of whole foods are better. They're more bioavailable. We can absorb them better. Usually they have higher quality ingredients in them uh, for the most part, not a, uh, a blanket statement. <laughs> that could be a whole other discussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But in terms of getting the vitamins, minerals, uh, amino acids, whatever it is you're looking for, usually they're better when consumed in whole food. But as you mentioned, supplements can fill that gap a little bit. So people have dietary inadequacies or... They just don't consume a lot of dairy, so they don't get a lot of calcium. They don't consume a lot of meat, so they may be missing out. You know, iron, don't consume fish, need some fish oil, whatever it is. Supplements can kind of fill that gap a little bit if if need be, if you're not getting it in your regular diet. Live in the north where you can't get in the sun yeah. for a good portion of the year. Absolutely. There's only, only so much we can do to get vitamin D here. <laughs> yeah. With our health care, too, I think sometimes people used to taking a medication or something, a magic pill to, to cure something so they think they can get a, a crappy diet or just eat whatever they want and be able to take a certain supplement or supplements and it's just automatically going to make them healthy or which maybe it will help, yes, right. but yeah, ultimately a good healthy diet I think is A1. Eating pizza seven times a week but taking 80 <laughs> pills isn't going to offset itself. You know, but being in a college setting, that's something that there's no way around it. College kids just usually don't eat for that sure. well, whether it's they don't know or they can't afford to. So hard to yeah. cook in a dorm room. Yeah, so sometimes getting a multivitamin, you know, not a bad option because it helps them get some of those vitamins and minerals that they're probably not getting in their regular diet. For sure. Yeah, that's one I know we've talked a lot about too. It's just like knowing what you should take. I think we maybe it's something we can kind of. Like, how or you should go about addressing it before we go and, like, actually say our specific recommendations. Like, what would be baseline? So, I mean, lab work would be the best way to go about trying to find this stuff. And, unfortunately, there's still not a really good, affordable option out there yet. And I know that's something we've all talked about wanting to see more of, but like a wellness FX that can go and do some of that stuff. Or even, potentially, your physician if they're really cool and will help you out with that. But... You know, like, where where would you say to start? Like you mentioned the multivitamin. Is that your just number one go-to because? Yeah, just because the vitamins and minerals are, are so important for overall health and wellness, and if you're not getting adequate amounts of them over time, they can cause some pretty serious issues, and you're definitely just going to be working at suboptimal levels. So that would probably be the first place to start. A lot of those you can detect with just basic blood work um, a lot of those show up on different panels that you can request and that might be you know that your first place to look like you said and then from there looking at other just kind of general dietary patterns you know do you consume enough fish on a weekly basis which most people don't at all so maybe then you need to look at a fish oil supplement to make sure you're getting some of those essential fatty acids uh, you, we mentioned vitamin d earlier too so you know, during the summer months, you may not need it, but on you know, the upper Midwest in the winter, we don't see the sun a whole lot, so that might be a period of time where mm -hmm. you're just trying to bring yourself back up to, to normal. So once you kind of... I it on my trip to Mexico. Figured I'd, yeah, <laughs> I figured I'd have it covered. I didn't need to OD enough. on vitamin D. Yeah, so once you kind of 
you know, bring yourself up to normal or fill some of those gaps in your, your just kind of general dietary habits, then you can maybe look at maybe some of the more performance enhancing ones if you're an athlete or if you're working out uh, regularly at higher intense levels, then maybe, you know, there's certain supplements that could help you, you know, perform better, enhance training adaptations over time. And then it's just kind of looking at what, what kind of training are you doing? What kind of benefits are you looking for? And then you can kind of look at, okay, which supplements can, can potentially help you? And then, you know, how do you take it? How much? For sure. Kind of get into all that. Multis are uh, essential in our household, too, with just the kids. I mean, I know a lot of kids are just like ours. You know, you don't maybe get as many fruits and veggies as ideally mm-hmm. they would. Um for us too, I mean, as adults, I think it's hard to get enough fruits and veggies in the yeah, day. So absolutely. just supplementing with that multi is nice to have just as a backup plan or you know, just Cheese, a little security. Cheeseburger is not full of <laughs> vitamins and minerals, unfortunately. No. So that's usually the one I I start with on huh? multi yeah. yeah. Is, let's yeah. start looking at a high quality multivitamin and then some of those other ones that we've kind of mentioned. I know we we wanted to kinda of go and do like recommendations and just looking at our short ish list already um that could get very long so i don't know do we want to go and say like everybody like your top three or four and then maybe what you would echo slash maybe add on and then maybe do a couple like fringe ones because mm-hmm. my like mine change a little bit depending yep. on the day um yeah. I would say I've got like four that I would be like this would be your best way to go. So right, I don't know. You want to start? Yeah. Uh, usually I like breaking it into kind of general population. Let's go with general pop for a yeah. health and wellness approach. So my first one, like I, I mentioned, is usually kind of a multivitamin. Yep. Um, and then, as I've already mentioned a couple times, usually a fish oil because mm-hmm. most people don't consume enough of that in their daily diets. They need to get those essential fatty acids. Uh, then I kind of start looking into times of the year vitamin d is usually another one we found most people especially around here are are probably vitamin d deficient and just aren't aware of it so that's usually another one that i go to during certain times of the year and then you know depending on what other dietary habits they may have you know if we're working with a vegetarian they may be more prone to deficiencies with certain you know vitamins or minerals um, and need to you know, incorporate some types of supplements again to fill those gaps and then lastly just looking at the more I learn about kind of digestive health and how that can influence immune system even performance things like that usually I'll recommend some kind of a probiotic or even digestive enzymes to help uh, because a lot of people particularly ones who consume a lot of processed foods um, kind of lower quality nutrition type sources usually have GI issues or they aren't even aware of them so that's where certain probiotics and digestive enzymes can help because that'll make you feel better, it'll help improve the immune system. I actually had a question on that as I was looking at our thing. So I had a strength coach when I was at a former place of work that was big on mineral deficiencies and, you know, not that he was trained in it, but that was like his thing. And then he was all on digestive enzymes and recommended some of them to the athletes and the athletes started looking into them some more and there was a lot of talk about like basically throwing money away because they're all getting broken down before they actually would get to your intestine to actually help and and again i just asking just because of the acid that it's got to go through in your stomach to even get there um well most of the because you're trying to get it to your small intestine obviously with with everything else but and some of them even work within the the stomach itself and some of them are kind of different forms of acid Mm -hmm. or naturally and naturally enzymes that we produce naturally and we're just trying to increase the amount of those within the, the gi system to help break down other larger food particles so sometimes people who take probiotics or digestive enzymes now all of a sudden they're less deficient in other vitamins and minerals because now they can better digest their food, they can absorb it more like they're designed to, and then it makes the bioavailability of those foods go up from there. So just kind of another benefit of taking some of those if you're not digesting your food like you're supposed to, I guess. I got one more quick call. 
prebiotic versus probiotic? I've, I haven't done a lot of looking into it, but I know I've heard some things about prebiotics and that potentially being an alternative route or potentially a better route than probiotic just because it's allowing your body to basically figure out what it needs yep, so and pro- turn it. So. Probiotics are just kind of live bacteria that we're supposed to have within our gut microbiome. So if you don't have enough of those, which we're finding more in an industrialized society, we're eating less you know, foods from the earth kind of thing, so we're not getting as much of that taking probiotic. Taking too many antibiotics. Taking <laughs> too many antibiotics, antibacterial soap, all yeah, those yeah. things are wiping out the bacteria that we're normally consuming and are supposed to, to consume. So we may not have enough of that good bacteria in our gut, so that's where probiotics can offer some benefits is they're getting more of that mm-hmm. good bacteria into your system, whereas prebiotics help to feed that bacteria that you're supposed to have. So prebiotics are... Gotcha. The food source for our bacteria within so the So at gut. some point you may switch from a pro over to a pre if you feel like you're starting to get back to a level that you could should be at. Yep. So instead of just continuously shoveling in more. Exactly. Okay. So if you are on antibiotics, Perfect. usually they recommend probiotics with Makes it sense. to make sure you're maintaining the gut, you know, microbiome environment and then once you get it to normal then you start eating prebiotic rich foods okay. to just feed that good bacteria so you have a healthy GI system, I guess. So that makes sense. They, off, they both offer benefits. For sure. It's, it's which one you need at any given time. Gotcha. So you say prebiotic rich foods. What does that what would entail? A lot of them are kind of resistant starches, they're called. So uh, potatoes, bananas. Could live with that. <laughs> yeah, things that <laughs> we don't necessarily digest very well, but our bacteria feeds off of that. And some of the the byproducts of that fermentation in our gut feed the good bacteria in the gut. So okay. it's a kind of a feed forward mm-hmm. type of benefit. Nice. What about you? So a lot of the recommendations I give are based on uh, the general population, just with what I see mm-hmm. uh, with patients. Um, I kind of gear that more towards just an anti-inflammatory approach. So a lot of times um, the people come into my office, I've just got uh, deflame.com is a great uh, resource. It just talks about kind of reducing of Interesting. inflammation. Uh, Dr. David Seaman uh, works for Anabolic Labs. He does uh, awesome, awesome work. Very knowledgeable. I've done some seminars with him. Um, so basically, an inflammation is a good process, obviously, in the body at, in small s- Control, stages, like yeah, acute yeah, yeah. inflammation. But uh, when it becomes chronic, you know, then it ultimately can kind of have the opposite effect where just detrimental and um, kind of so these pro-inflammatory foods what we eat can be either anti-inflammatory or pro-inflammatory so the food can cause actually us to produce these pro-inflammatory chemicals what these chemicals do then is basically make us more sensitive to pain so our nociceptors it kind of lowers that threshold so that way you know maybe if it took a hundred to to reach that threshold before maybe it only takes 30 just of a given unit so uh, just inflammation in general you see it um, with a lot of pain processes that people will come in for um, but then there's a whole host of just our chronic illness diseases in in America that we see are all inflammatory conditions so um, a lot of the recommendations I give are just more uh, in inflammation um, typically, I recommend uh, like a phyto multi uh, type multivitamin, um, fish oil, uh, another one, um, high high quality for all these. Uh, vitamin D three is another one, and um, my understanding actually, so sometimes people say, oh yeah, well I I go in and get vitamin D shots. A lot of times when they get the the vitamin D shots, it's vitamin D two, which isn't nearly as beneficial for us than mm-hmm. vitamin D3 so people getting vitamin D shots yeah the, so like weren't like, you the D. one that told me that some endurance athletes have to get those no we would do super high dose pills oh I thought they were injected new oh. it's like a 50 like 50,000 50,000 I use but yeah. once once a week mm-hmm. is what we would put like stress fracture injuries on just to help right. with calcium absorption and just general muscle and bone health mm-hmm. um, that was something we were looking to potentially do for our athletes 
when I had one school I was at is to have that available that, where they could get their vitamin D during, especially the, especially the winters. Nice. Yeah. So, so much. It so is. A lot. That was, well, it was physician prescribed. Yeah. I mean, if there's a need for it, but. I saw, there, I was kind of researching this and there's a study they did in Saudi Arabia for whatever reason. Um, and all these people were basically deficient in vitamin D at various levels. And they gave them uh, various amounts and all of them, they had, they had low back pain. All of them had low back pain. And they gave them, you know, large amounts of vitamin D and nobody had side effects for too much vitamin D levels. And like 95% of them actually had a reduction or elimination of their low back pain. So that's pretty significant. That's the one that fascinates me because vitamin D is fat soluble, correct? Right. Like that, if anything is going to ever overdose, those are the ones you get yep. concerned about. Whereas like vitamin C is water. I'm yeah. trying to yep. go back to my nutrition class yep. where you can goes right blow it up and then whatever you don't use is gone. Yeah. 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 Which I find very interesting because that was always the one like, I think when I told you that, that was your initial reaction is like, how much are they taking? Yeah. <laughs> but because if you, you know, like you said, when you're in Mexico, you didn't take it, you know, people who are out in the sun all day long, they're synthesizing get, uh, it. Yeah, they'll get a ton of vitamin D, you know, probably close to some of those mm-hmm. high dose ranges. So obviously people aren't dropping dead from being out in the sun too long. So they're, I don't think we really quite know what the upper limit is. There, for a while, they had you know, recommendations on what that was, but now we've shattered those right, preconceptions, yeah. and people are taking far above that and still fine. And so, who I've started following the Vitamin D Council and get their weekly newsletter, uh, which might be something to support for what you're saying, because there's sure. a lot of you know, like low back pain, this weight management, you know, diabetes type things, where they're just specifically looking at that vitamin and I know that's one of those, like, I've heard a lot of people saying how big it is just because it's also extremely inexpensive. Oh, yeah. On the big one spectrum, the it's one of the cheaper stuff. ones. Yeah. Definitely the hottest vitamin on the market right Yeah, now. for sure. It's kind of a, you know, you people think about cold season, too, and that's usually <clears throat> when people are more indoors. So mm-hmm. that they've kind of wondered if the correlation there, you know, if they're not being outside as much, getting that vitamin D mm-hmm. from the sun, you know, maybe that has a reason to do with why people get colds in the winter months I guess see that yeah that's one to add like I've started doing more with vitamin C and just kind of on a I think I do that one on an every other day basis just a couple thousand milligrams I believe that's what the vitamin C rolls in that would be one potential one um, I really like like a fruit and greens powder because yeah. I try and eat more Vegetables, I've kind of weaned off the fruit just for various reasons, but vegetables especially. Um, and knowing I probably don't eat enough, that's my one like cheat in the middle of the day just to make sure I get that extra serving. Um, that's one I'm big on, and it tastes really good. We, um, I like that a lot too. Or you know, mix into, yeah, it, it mix into a protein shake if that's something else you might be deficient in. Uh, that's something the weight loss one where you're like, yeah, your protein levels are probably higher than you think, you know, kind of a two birds, one stone kind of shake, mm-hmm. you know, with that. And then my sleeper one, and I want to do more working with this for multiple reasons. I actually want to, I was going to ask you guys if you had sleeper ones, is the glutathione amino acid. And I first heard of it on a podcast, it's Joe Rogan with, I think it was Dr. Mark Gordon, who does a lot of, um, head trauma research with hormone levels. I think he's an endocrinologist. So he's done a lot of like former military and looking at previous head trauma and where their hormone levels are and they've been sort of working with their hormones and trying to basically bring in their life back because you know testosterone was way down, cortisol was up through the roof. Um, and I can't remember the other ones so I'm not gonna try and make something up and get it wrong. But um, he got talking about it and he's like, yeah, I use this glutathione, it's great for either A, preventing a hangover from happening, or B, helping after the fact that you've already given yourself one because it's one of the bigger amino acids in your liver, and that's part of the reason, like, you get drunk is because you deplete the store so you can actually up it. Well, I've tried it a couple times, not in that regard, I have tried, but also (laughs) just general health-wise, like, if I feel cold coming on, if I feel... Like, I just had a really bad day eating. Like, I, I just knew it was not a good day. 
I'll utilize, try a few of those, and it seems to help my body just function better to like process everything and get me feeling back to normal quicker. And I don't know if I actually fought off a cold or not, because I'll, you know, if you feel that coming, I don't truly believe in the whole like just thousands of milligrams of vitamin C, just go, 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 but making sure that I was taking it consistently and then trying this, and I feel like my body was able to deal with it better. And I think I fought off a couple of little minor things that, you know, could knock you out for a week, and I got rid of, you know, with just some congestion in two days. So that's, one, like, my sleeper one for a variety of reasons. But Interesting. I've heard that same thing, too, if you're going to go out drinking, slam some glutathione. <laughs> But yeah, I tried just the pill form. He had recommended one that you actually like put underneath your tongue, and then it dissolves and absorbs because it's obviously probably the quickest way, short of injecting, to get it into sure. your bloodstream. Um, not big on needles, so we're not yeah. gonna worry about that one. So probably good. Yeah. Any other general? I usually recommend uh, a magnesium. Um, a lot of no, times. one of the docs we work with is starting to come around on that. She's started suggesting that to her patients. Yeah, I was doing a little reading and um, most people don't get enough of mm-hmm. the, you know, RDA, which are already low, I think, anyways. So uh, just a way to supplement that. It's kind of tough to get about dietary, that. to get high enough amounts. So uh, typically I'll recommend magglycinate because it's a better absorbed form where there's like a, a citrate and a mm-hmm. mag oxide, which is basically like a, a crystal. So, um, the glycinate is going to be better absorbed. The, the citrate, if someone's bound up, it might help clean them out because you're not um, absorbing yeah. it as much, so it can kind of loosen the stools a little bit more, so you're not going to get as much absorptive effect. But magnesium, um, I think there's like 300 processes in the body that uses it, so uh, very important as well. Um, yeah, those are kind of the, the big generals, I guess, that I recommend. For an older population, I'll recommend like a uh, glucosamine chondroitin uh, for joint health. Yeah, um, I like the fish oil for that too. It's yep, yeah, it's anti- just all anti-inflammatory stuff. So, um, people, I think, used to get a lot more bone broth and stuff with their soups when it was made. You know, mm-hmm. years ago, they'd actually boil the bones. So I think you got the benefits of it there, but it's not used as much anymore so I think it's good to that's one that I've that. liked and tried is the, like the collagen protein for mm. something like that just because I think you when you're doing bone broth you get more of that yep into your actual food but yeah do we want to move on to athletes in the interest of Kyle having to get to back to watch one of his A athletes sporting event <laughs> one more quick one I want to say is a Q, CoQ10 uh, so if people are on statins which is one of the most prevalent medications that uh, statins actually inhibit the body's production of CoQ10, so uh, they actually made um, patented a uh, supplement or a, a medication with uh, a statin with the CoQ10, hmm. but it's actually not in the market for whatever reason. I have no idea why. Seven but, levels uh, of FDA testing. Yeah, basically. So if, if anyone's on a statin, they typically should be on a CoQ10 as well. All right. Awesome. Yeah, that's my rant. <laughs> Athletes. All right, athletes, go. Well, even just bringing up athletes, usually I break them down into kind of more strength and power athletes and then endurance athletes, or do I just keep them all together? Why don't we go, just again, in the sake of time, and maybe we can come back and we'll do one just on athletes to get more specific with it, but like um, the general athlete, like just even a college athlete or what you would recommend like a high school athlete that you know when we talk about or even just the weekend warrior kind of throw that into the mix um let's start there and then we can venture off sure so you that's possible or is it easier to to break it down kind of depends how specific i guess you you really (laughs) want to get with them so you know starting off with just our general athlete a lot of times i'll Reference back to everything we just got done talking yep. about. You know, if your your diet's deficient in all these different vitamins, and minerals, fatty acids, you may have to look there as well. Just like any other person, a healthy athlete is one that is going to perform better, and um, so that's something that you know recommend the same things that we we really just went through. 
Uh, and then if we get into the, some of the more performance enhancing supplements, usually the first one that I'll, I'll maybe look to is... Maybe let's just cover that. Let's just talk performance enhancing and maybe not so specific to athletes so we can cover the whole spectrum. Yep. I think that would work well. <clears throat> so if you want to put protein on that list or this if you want to just... A disclaimer, we're not talking about steroids. Yes. <laughs> when we say performance enhancing. Right. We'll have that scroll across the bottom. <laughs> yeah. D. Gordon knows what that's all about right now. <laughs> all right. Um, so, so protein. Yeah, protein would be one of the first ones I look at, whether or not you want to classify it as a dietary supplement or just think of it as a whole food source. Regardless, they need a lot of it. And yeah. most of them don't consume enough, particularly female athletes in my experience. So whether they are just going to eat more, again, whole food sources, which is fine, or if they're not, then protein supplements can, again, help fill that gap a little bit. And especially from my experience, too, working with large athletes or ones who have really, really high calorie demands and protein demands, you know, if they have to eat 200, you know, even 300 grams of protein a day, you're probably going to get sick if you try to do that on just chicken breasts and the whole food sources. So, I mean, that's 15, 16 chicken breasts a day or something would, you'd have to eat that much to hit that kind of but protein you could get goal. 60 so, grams in two scoops. Right, so protein scoops, bars, things like that, um, you know, they help get higher amounts of protein in without leaving you feeling sick, mm-hmm. and they're more convenient for athletes on the go and so forth. So that's one that can offer a lot of benefits that way. Uh, and then creatine is, is so usually, gonna say it? Is usually gonna the next there? one I go to. Yeah. Uh, you know, I could have added this to, to the general population too because oh, absolutely. the majority of research with creatine right now is not for sport performance applications. It's for general health and wellness. Alzheimer's, I've heard some Al- big stuff Alzheimer's, with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, muscular dystrophy, um, burn victims, people who are on bed rest, older adults. Uh, it's been shown to benefit people not only in helping to maintain muscle mass throughout the aging process, but there's a lot of neurocognitive benefits mm-hmm. um, that we're seeing with a lot of creatine supplementation, and even in, in yeah, infants who are deficient. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my, my mentor does a lot of research. He's written books on it, uh, who kind of trained me, and he's given several talks at national conventions and conferences on just the health and medical benefits of creatine supplementation. And and we would kind of talk when I was in grad school that this is probably one that may be added to a nutrition facts panel. I mean, it'll take a while to get there, but it'll be something like, make sure you get your daily creatine in. Interesting. Mm. Um, and some people get some, you know, a, a gram or two of creatine if they're eating a lot of animal products because it's in meat, more in red chicken, meat. things yeah, like yeah. that. But most people probably aren't getting enough as they either need, or if we're looking at more performance benefits, they're probably not hitting that amount either. So I, say, I feel like there's that big, like, I know there's a stigma with it because it's been for years, like, and I was going to ask you, has this been thoroughly debunked where it's terrible on your kidneys yeah. and it's going to dehydrate you and you need to make sure you're drinking tons of water with it. And all that's even still gets brought up even mm-hmm. now, but then it's also got the stigma of it's just that only performance enhancing, like the stigma that it has to be that, not that you just take a quote unquote maintenance dose mm-hmm. along with your multivitamin. Right. Like that's just so foreign to people. Yeah, I mean, there's been thousands of published articles on creatine, and none of them have shown any incidence of kidney damage. And it's been around long damage. enough been around now a long that we time. can... Yep, and then... I think the Russians scared everybody with it. <laughs> well, and, and what caused the uproar is people... They had these athletes that had died, unfortunately, and they happened to be on creatine, and people would say, oh, it was creatine that was killing these, while well, they were also on steroids, they were also on all these other performance-enhancing drugs. Probably some diuretic or yep. something to and make sure that they didn't get they busted were, for the steroids. They yeah. were stacked on top of each other, and they were doing all kinds of other things that probably killed them more so than, than creatine. For alone. sure. <clears throat> so it's, it's gotten a bad reputation, and I think people... I think that's losing a little bit of steam. I think they're realizing some of the benefits of it. Um, I know caffeine is a big one. I think that would be a good one to touch on here, yep. and then we can kind of start going into some of the bewares and things to look at. Yep, caffeine would have been... How long you got? You got another 10 minutes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, 9.20, we're good. 
perfect. Oh, okay. Well, let's keep going. <laughs> caffeine. I was shooting for 8.30, so. Yeah. Caffeine's another one on my list for both endurance and strength and power athletes. <clears throat> um, another, the most researched yeah. drug. Right. Supplement. Usually <laughs> one that people, ever. people don't have any issues getting their caffeine. In. No. <laughs> um, let's see what's else on the list. Beta alanine's another one. I feel like that's kind of up and coming. Beta alanine? Just, I feel like I hadn't heard a ton about it, and now you just see a little bit more and more. Yeah, it's... Cool. What it, and even Kyle asked me, and I was trying to fill him in as best as I could. Like, what does it do? So, beta alanine helps you produce more carnosine within skeletal muscle tissue, and carnosine is one of the buffers that we have to kind of counteract the buildup of hydrogen ions and the drop in pH that we see during high-intensity exercise. So, so people that are... Yeah, the burn. Mm-hmm. So you're doing high reps, you're sprinting at, you know, a fast pace, you know, 400, 800 meter type of events. I think some you of the 800 that, mile guys really like it. Yeah, you get that build up of hydrogen ions, it drops pH. Our muscles, uh, metabolic pathways don't like to work in an acidic environment. So you feel the burn, you drop your intensity, slow your pace, whatever it is you're doing. So we have these buffering systems in place. Carnosine is one of them within the muscle. So the more carnosine we have, the more we can buffer that accumulation of hydrogen ions. So it allows you to maintain that faster clip for a longer period of time or to get another rep or two before your quads are on fire that you have to stop whatever you're doing. So that's where beta alanine works. For the most part, um, the research has been pretty promising, uh, but it's not as black and white of a, a supplement as creatine seems to be in that regard. So gotcha. it really and seems to like yeah, that, yeah. It only seems to benefit athletes who really kind of train at that really high intense level or are doing bouts of exercise or competition from like 60 seconds to three to four minutes that I gotta type imagine of like a crossfit athlete that would be yeah. money yep so <laughs> a lot of these all if you're not taking it <laughs> yeah a lot of these supplements that have shown a lot of promise usually get lumped all together into you know pre-workout types of products yep. so if yep. you ever look at the label on them usually they have caffeine creatine, beta alanine, usually branched chain amino acids and things like that in them because they've shown a lot of promise individually. So let's throw them all together in a super supplement and see what they can do. Do you like that combination effect? <sighs> yeah, it's nice because you don't have to take four different kinds of scoops well, and different what's kinds your of pills. On that? Like sure. Doing that or do you feel like you get a better, would you get a better result if you kind of took them more individual or does it? Is anything really shown that that matters? I don't. I don't. At the best of my knowledge, I've never seen anyone make that kind of comparison. It'd be really okay. difficult. To yeah. Do well, it. I just yeah. I, I like if you're on a time frame type thing. I just yeah, like I the the convenience of it more than anything. And then it kind of comes down to the specific brand and the specific ingredients. Cell phone companies now are getting a lot better at having open labels so they tell you not only the ingredient but the amount of each one mm-hmm. in there usually they used to just be lumped together as a proprietary blend or an uh, energy matrix and you're like a little like the cross or yeah, something next the to asterisk, asterisk, and you're like yeah. uh, well how much am i really getting so now they've kind of moved towards more of an open label type of process so they're kind of disclaiming or disclosing everything so mm-hmm. they're saying hey this is all the ingredients these are the amounts of each one and then you can kind of look at, okay, do they have the recommended amount of creatine in there that's been shown to be beneficial? Do they have the appropriate dose of beta alanine in there? Uh, is the caffeine high enough but not too high where you're going to lose your mind in the, the weight room or anything like that? Start shaking. Yeah. yeah, and then, you know, one thing that we'll get into later is some pre-workout supplements. Some of the older ones would throw in some stimulant <laughs> derivatives almost like speed essentially to get you so amped up and yeah, buzzed and, uh, yeah. and some of that well not necessarily some version of it yeah more amphetamine, amphetamine based yeah. yeah yeah and they've gotten a lot of bad rep and negative attention with which is justifiably so <laughs> yeah that's it. Um, so people were just getting so amped up and high that oh this is a great product it's like well those things shouldn't be in there that's you know legal for those to be in there banned substances but we'll get into some of that stuff later so the higher quality pre-workouts i like um from Actually, a research standpoint from and a recommendation because all of our guys think you know at uwl think they probably need a pre-workout <laughs> gotta get that buzz kind of <laughs> my favorite one we we just published a study on this last month is jim stepani's supplement line he has his pre-workout called pre-gym is the name of it it's got a lot of the ingredients that I like in a pre-workout supplement, the amounts that I like 
and it, it tastes good. The research that we did showed that it had some benefit on improving muscular endurance, made people feel better during the workout. So it wasn't, you know, oh my gosh, this is an amazing supplement, but it, it, it definitely showed some benefits, and we're going to hopefully follow it up with more of a long-term training study, like, okay, if you take it for six months, is it going to improve training adaptations and things like that. I would say one of the other ones that I like is Lane Norton just created a new one. Uh, Carbon is the, the name of his supplement line. So this has a lot of the same kind of ingredients, but it's also stimulant-free or caffeine-free. So people who train oh, nice. late at night or you know get their workout in at 7, 8 o'clock, you don't want to take three, 400 <laughs> milligrams of caffeine. This is a nice alternative to that because you can still get a lot of the benefits of the other ingredients common to pre-workout supplements, but you're, again, you're not getting amped up and then trying to fall asleep a couple hours after the workout. So I like that he he went to that. He's kind of one of the first ones that have actually gone away from some of the stimulant For sure. loaded pre-workout supplements. So hmm. That would kind of be my list. We can get into some more kind of fringe on? ones, I guess. Yeah, I don't know if we need to start going too far into the fringe. I was going to ask on a couple, but we can save that for another day. Beetroot juice and uh, betaine and Tart cherry juice would be my other ones that are kind of some up and coming ones that BCA is thoughts. <clears throat> any, you have any thoughts? Actually, I was listening this to is, Ferris this. again, and he was saying because he's big on his slow carb diet, so it's not going too into ketosis, and it's more focusing on the beans and things to help you feel full. But doing a lot of that, um, but he's saying especially as you're going through it and you get a little. If you're having those sugar cravings as you're going off of it, he recommends three grams. That sound like a relatively not holy crap amount. Oh yeah, or so. Probably be on the because line. just of some of the amino acids can actually get turned into a little bit of glucose to then help at least stave off that sugar craving to make you not want to go and eat cake. Mm-hmm. instead but just to have that but it's also going to obviously be beneficial to you because you get a little bit of that protein in there yep so most of the you know if we're ever breaking down muscle tissue or burning proteins for fuel it's the branch chain amino acid ones that we can kind of oxidize for fuel and convert to glucose like you said so I, i've never really heard of that approach but it, it makes some sense as i like to see them like when we try to use them as like our nighttime recovery just to give the athlete a extra little bit of amino acids before they're going to bed that can process while they're sleeping. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not you're not drinking having a slam of protein shake before you go to bed if you're just not hungry and then you don't have all the sugar and the carbs mm-hmm. and all those things going with it. So, I mean, if you're getting a high quality protein like a whey protein type option, you, you're going to have enough of the branch chain amino acids in there. So usually I say if you're getting those, you probably don't need to isolate them and take them individually. But if you're not, yeah, then they can definitely offer some benefits. So, so if you ever look at the amino acid profile, most you know protein supplements still have the branched chain amino acids on there. Sometimes they even highlight them on the product saying, hey, look how many of these we have. Interesting. Let's go on to some of the... How you should decide risks, things to look out for, rec- recommend like loose recommendations. You know, in terms of how much potentially you should be doing going to there. Sure. Where you want to start? <laughs> I don't know. That was like eight questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's what we've got a bunch of things listed underneath yeah. that. You know, like, and we had kind of talked about before. Like, how do you go, or where would you start? And I know what I would do from the athlete end. I'll do that and. We just touched on it, like, to not, if you're going to go and start looking to take supplements, to not go and get ripped off. Like, we had talked about some of the not, you know, labeled brands that were just big box that were shown to not have, like, anything in it other than fillers and things like that. Like, how do you, how do I not go and just buy $100 of sh- sugar and not realize it? Yeah, that's... No easy answer to that one. Usually just kind of my general rule of thumb is you usually get what you pay for with supplements. If you find a, oh my gosh, this is a killer deal on eBay, <laughs> yeah, it's some guy probably made that supplement in his bathtub. And I'm going to see if I can find the <laughs> clip from Bigger, Faster, Stronger where he makes his, oh, yeah, if That's we can a find that, example. where he goes and he gets, have you ever seen that? I have He goes and he picks up a couple 
raw ingredients. Uh, raw ingredients, some pills, labels, tubs, a couple Mexican guys that were just looking for some work and they go in his kitchen and basically make like a full on supplement line in like an afternoon. Wow. You know, package it, do all that, slap a label on it, and goes, we'll retail this for 80 bucks. And if we can get one guy to say it works, he goes, we'll make money. And I think in all, like, it would co- it cost him less than like $10 to you make know. it, like a per bottle or something, or like it might have even been four. I can't remember. I'll see if I can't find that specific clip on YouTube, but it was just like one of those, like, uh, it's wait, scary. what? Yeah. <laughs> most, I guess not most supplements, but there are supplements out there that follow good manufacturing mm-hmm. practices. They've been kind of verified by third party mm-hmm. testing companies that go in there and say, yeah, you guys are making these the way they're designed to. Here's our stamp of approval. So a lot of labels or, um, you know, individual products will have some kind of verification on there. So whether it is the GMP approval, that means their manufacturing plant got approved by this good manufacturing practices, uh, practices, Mm -hmm. verification process, whatever that is. Um, They'll put that stamp on it. Or there's ones like some of the AdvoCare products. You can see the top, they have their informed choice, um, showing that it's free of banned substances. It doesn't have any... And what's in there on the label is in there. Yep. Um, NSF is another one, just kind of an example of a, a third-party quality control watchdog. So they've they've tested it, they've sampled it, it's got the ingredients it says it does, no banned substances in there, so you can place a lot more confidence in those kind of products. So I usually tell people, make sure you're buying ones that have those on their label. And you had mentioned consumer labs too. <coughs> yeah, so if does you a lot ever, of testing. If you ever want to look at which product is better, so I mean if you ever start looking going to online or GNC, obviously there's tons of different types of protein, different types of creatine, mm-hmm. different multivitamins. And then it kinda is, well, which one's better? Um, well companies like Consumer Lab, Labdoor, they've done the kind of quality control testing to compare one product to another. So what's the quality of that probiotic look like compared to some of the other ones on the market? Or does that creatine supplement actually contain five grams of creatine per scoop, like the label says, or there's some fillers in there uh, and other things like that. So those companies, unfortunately, they're kind of spending to pay for a year-long subscription, but that's all you do is you pay for a monthly subscription, and then they send you out their monthly newsletter and say, hey, here's the, the products that we tested this month, and we we ranked them. So here's the number one multivitamin. It's got absolutely everything that it says it does, you know, really high bioavailability and all those kind of things or different, you know, fish oils. Mm -hmm. They kind of break it down into each category and literally will just provide you with a list or something alarming that came out with some of their research. So they're nice because they're they're third party. They're not backing any particular supplement at least i really hope i never see that that story busts i put a lot of faith in in companies like that Hmm. so those are ones again if you're ever curious which product is better that's really the only way to know for sure is to look at some of those quality control testing companies that are out there so nice to have a third party saying you know they have no horse in the race basically they just in theory yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> hard to, i want to believe it but yeah. it's hard to yeah i can't help feel that way as well going back to what you said too is just um i tell patients the most expensive supplement you buy is the one that doesn't work so you can go into the, the big box store and sure it is a lot cheaper but you get like you said you get what you pay for why why waste your money on it if it's yeah. got nothing in it but mm-hmm. fillers you know spend the money if you're going to do it and get something that's reliable and mm-hmm. gonna work for you so yeah, we I, use the Aegis shield we talked about that one that's it's a less expensive but it's i think it's like three bucks a year but for athletes either high school or in college or above to go in and they test i don't know if they farm out but they're a drug testing company and, yes. they'll, and they'll go and look at each one and tell you if it's okay if it's questionable or if it's banned based yeah. on what you select, whether that be NCAA, IAAF, WADA, you, know, it, it, you can choose which one you want. So we, anytime, or we try to, to make sure our kids aren't taking something that they shouldn't be here. Yeah. If they have questions, I'll just run it through that app, and it's a simple answer. And if they don't have it, you can request, and usually like, within a couple of days they have the answer for you, which yeah. is pretty impressive. Nice. So if you're an athlete or working with athletes, definitely get that app. Mm-hmm. It's, a quick, it's worth the three bu- yeah, $3. quick way to look at because a lot of the products that are out there have 
15, 20 ingredients in them. So it's not just the product itself, it's what actually is in there. For sure. So the, like you said, the, all these organizations, sports organizations, have their own banned substances list, things they allow or don't allow, and everyone's different depending on it. IWF, you like can't take albuterol. They like won't let you. Oh, yeah. Taurine's one that's on some lists, on uh, others, and that's in pretty much every energy drink yeah. out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> well, some technically, have, caffeine's a banned substance yeah, in a high enough dose. Right. I, th- I want to say Wada dropped that from their list. I think but. it's still somewhere on the NCAA one, but you'd have to drink like nine cups of coffee like right <laughs> before you walked in to do your urine right. test. So. Which, you know, some people probably push that limit. It's not necessarily a pot of coffee, but caffeine pills or oh, yeah, you yeah, take yeah. a pre workout. Oh, yeah. A little you caffeine know, powder so underneath the, double the, the scoop gum line. And yeah, take yeah, yeah. a pill. Uh, but, and these lists change every year. I just asked Maria Sharapova. You mm, know, uh, they came up with their updated list in January. Whether or not her staff intentionally ignored it, but they didn't look at it, and then she got popped uh, for taking mold uh, something. And now we're finding out a lot of other people out of that country also have failed that test. Weird. <laughs> the majority of the Russia is about to lose. I don't know how many gold medals. Yeah. In track, like it's insane. Their whole <laughs> under seventeen hockey team had to drop out of the world championships in North Dakota a couple weeks ago because they were all all on this drug. No way. Wow. Wow. Seventeen under two. Uh, it, it unfortunately fits the stigma. I feel like. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, not a lot of people were very surprised. To kind of wrap up, do we want to go back? Like, I know one, and we've talked about this, if you can go back like 10 years kind of thing, but just something that you've kind of learned in your own supplement use that you would like want to pass on, you know, to either the high school athlete or just the general wellness person, and each of us kind of cover one of those and kind of use that to kind of wrap this one up. Sure. That sounds good. Sound like a decent one? Yep. <laughs> so for mine, if I could go back and yell at myself <laughs> or yell at other young kids is, you know, we talked about some of these benefits that can improve performance, enhance training adaptations, but all of that should be, um, I guess, secondary. The first thing you should look at is what does your training program look like? Yeah. And if you're not training at a high enough level, none of these are going to really make you any better. Right. So for me... You know, back in high school, I was like, oh, I need I need my protein, I need my creatine, I need this NO booster because this guy at GNC said it'll help. Uh, yeah, exactly. And all of them, yeah, in certain situations probably could help, probably could make you bigger, faster, stronger. But if I think back to the way I was training in high school, I wasn't training consistently enough. My program wasn't, you know, periodized like it should have been. So I was definitely missing out on some of the benefits from it. So I was wasting a ton of money on supplements mm-hmm. just because I wasn't training hard enough for them to really make a difference. So for if sure. you look at the percent improvements with some of these that even have positive findings in the literature, it's, yeah, it can increase performance 5 7%. So if you're not training at a high enough level where that's going to really make a difference or competing at a high enough level, you know, what's the point? So you can... I would even wonder with, it, like, the elite level where there isn't 5% to really improve anymore, you know, if it's... Well, even For them, it might be that little one percent that they need to make the huge difference. But yeah, I, and then even at that level, it's almost like everyone is on creatine. So mm-hmm. if you're not, then you're slightly below the rest <laughs> For of the sure. pack sure. or something. That would be my advice. I think my advice would be similar in the regards of uh, not as much of a specific supplement, just diet in general, which yeah. we mentioned. I mean, yeah. we we mentioned it before and. It, it supplements don't replace a good diet, you know, just eating a good, you know, healthy, well-rounded anti-inflammatory type diet, I think is going to be much better off for everyone across the board, performance athletes, or, you know, just your general everyday nine to five worker or whatever. And I think that's the hardest thing I try to get across to patients is, you know, sure these supplements might help a little bit but if you change your dietary habits that's going to help night and day that's going to make a world of difference so i think um i guess that would probably be my biggest recommendation i think mine would be that too is just don't get caught up in the flashy ads and the promises of like unlocking genetic potential that you (laughs) didn't even know you had you know waking up cells that aren't even getting used like really 
I can buy that for seventy dollars. Like, come on, like that's I still get frustrated with the amount of money I spent on some things. But you know, like in college, I was just lifting to get big. I probably wasn't eating enough. I mean, I was trying to lift heavy, but again, back to your training thing. I know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Just made stuff up as I went. You know the back and bicep days along with your chest and tricep days and shoulders had their own yeah. and you know that kind of stuff and it's just like man could have done that so much better <laughs> but just so much money almost literally pissed away because <laughs> there wasn't doing literally. anything yeah you know just that's a good, a good thing. and go and ask questions like yeah try and find somebody like or get in and read something that's not a muscle magazine you picked up at the store like you don't necessarily have to go and read the research articles but there's good unbiased information research out there there's good people to follow that aren't just going to tout stuff to tout stuff right and maybe we will can talk about some good resources and just throw them in the bottom of the show notes and if we don't have them off the top of our head but people that will give you good information and it's not just about selling you their own product yeah, which I mean, is hard to find, but right. it, it can potentially happen. Be so. careful going in supplement stores without a plan, because <laughs> they'll try to sell you anything that they can. Not For all sure. of them, you know. There's some. We have some students that work in local supplement stores that are very knowledgeable in the area. And mm -hmm. But there's something like, that'll fix everything. Yeah, you know, you can't blame them. They're working on commission, so <laughs> the more they sell, the more money they make. For sure. So don't go in there and just blindly ask questions. Look for some of these resources that we'll put up there first so that you know what to take, what not to take, how much, and those kind of things. Anything else in closing? No? We'll have to do a follow-up, I think. There's we will definitely more that can be said. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know, I, I just would, if as people watch this, like if questions come up, you know, whether it's in the comment section or shooting us an email, um, we be all for it and happy to answer and talk more or if there's specific questions that another episode would be huge to do that would be you know even doing an episode like that where it's answering specific questions yep. I think could be really fun and beneficial so that would be good hit us up if you got questions yep. we'd, we'd be all for doing that I think that'd be really a good thing so absolutely alright sounds good I need my protein in. Sorry, yeah, yeah.